In a leafy suburb of Toronto lives one of the world's most controversial thinkers. Come on in. Thank you. The more I observe Jordan Peterson, the more concerned I become. It's not that I don't appreciate his principled stance on free expression and mandated speech. I do. It's just that there seems to be a sort of cult springing up around him. And many of his ideas are neither new, nor helpful, nor coherent. Peterson may not be alt-right, but his defences of traditionalism feed them. Peterson may speak eloquently on many of the problems facing men, but his solutions may simply continue to feed an unfair and unequal status quo. Worse yet, his defences of religion, whatever his personal stance may be, and he appears to believe in belief, they threaten to prolong our emergence from that ultimately oppressive hierarchy of ignorance. This video is structured around Peterson's appearance and interviews in a documentary entitled Truth in a Time of Chaos, which can be found on the channel Rebel Wisdom. Like if I asked you, would you please use they them pronouns for me? What? What? It would depend on what, what I thought hoops of your do you want us to jump through? Those what are my pronouns. Those are my. There's pronouns. no motivation. No, I know. Like, no one ever has any motivation. Peterson had something of a profile in Canada before the hyper-PC moral panics and trans issues blew up, but it was this issue around Bill C-16 and its relation to the legal enforcement of made-up gender pronouns that blew him up. Peterson, a reasonable, moderate, even liberal voice, became simultaneously a demon to the PC left, hero to the new right, and a symbol of hope to the dispossessed and excommunicated liberal bloc. This made him tremendously famous and infamous, and has given him a far higher profile and degree of success than he could ever have enjoyed as a mere professor, a lightning rod for the fractures in current society. He hasn't been shy of exploiting his moment in the spotlight, and who could blame him? He also appears to think that he is doing something vital and useful, and I believe that he believes this. I was being asked, as everyone is, to use a certain set of words that I think are the constructions of people who have a political ideology that I don't believe in and that I also regard as, as dangerous. To me, they're, 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 they're an attempt to control language and, and in a direction that isn't happening organically, it's not happening naturally, but by force and by fiat, and I would say by force because there's legislative power behind them. So and I don't so like I these made up words, Z and Zer and that sort of okay, thing. What about Peterson's argument against the enforcement of politicized newspeak was eloquent, calm, and well reasoned, as well as clearly not being grounded in bigotry. Yet this was how he was constantly misrepresented as a bigot. As much as he gave hope, seeing that constant misinterpretation and the attacks upon him was disheartening. It was clear that the other side, fueled by the best motivations, whatever the terrible results, were immune not only to reason, but to even comprehending what he was saying or why he disagreed with them. The legislation itself and the policies were signifying a crisis, a disjunction in Western society that was was far, of which the gender pronoun argument was only a tiny tendril. I put my finger on a nerve. Peterson believes that the pronoun argument and similar issues are a symptom of an underlying problem stemming from attacks on Western values, Western thought, liberalism, enlightenment, empiricism, and even deference to reality. And again, it's hard to fault him on this. I agree. Here is where the first inklings of concern begin, however, because for all that he is correct, these observations feed the crank conspiracy theories of the new right and the inaccurate uses of terms like cultural Marxism. No conspiracy is needed, just independent actors moving according to their own self-interests and something happening emergently. Further, Peterson appears to conflate Christian values with Western values. An assertion which I take tremendous issue with, I would say, Western values emerge from moving beyond and past religion. As time passed, many of those who flocked to his videos for an attack on political correctness became hooked by his message of transformation and transcendence, and began calling him one of the most profound thinkers of the time. 
I do not find Peterson profound. He is, in fact, a rather pedestrian and conventional thinker in a lot of ways. His message is not radical, but old-fashioned. Not the extreme nonsense of the new traditionalists, but a sort of comfortable nostalgia, like worn shoes or the scent of pipe smoke. This doesn't stop many of his proposed solutions being, perhaps, almost as bad as the things that he is opposing. Peterson has been studying belief systems his whole life, and how the most utopian ideas can create the worst outcomes. And he's concluded that only appreciation and integration of the great ideas of the past would protect us from the same things happening again. And herein lies the great contradiction of Peterson. He opposes utopianism, but his nostalgic view of the past, his rose-tinted understanding of Christianity and other traditional structures, ignores the fact that these two were utterly horrific and also utopian. Horrific in a way that the horrors of the 20th century tend to pale next to, because the 20th century horrors were technological, industrialised, impersonal and relatively short-lived, while the horrors that came before were personal, institutional and universal rather than aberrations. It's a battle of the argument from tradition versus the argument from novelty, and both are fallacies for very good reason. Sort of way because I think that the past is not only has value, it's we cannot live without the integration of the past. No more than you can live as an individual without integrating your past. I mean, we're historical creatures, right? And and we, we without if we're not united con consciously with the past, then we're divided w internally and socially, and that has consequences. The greatest value of the past is in teaching us the mistakes that we have made and what to avoid in the future. Much of what Peterson criticises is now in the past. Communism, Marxism, these are largely spent forces, at least in terms of their 20th century misapplications. But that doesn't mean we should delve back even before then for answers. These things were, after all, reactions of their own, attempts to address the stark inhumanity of religious, capitalistic and aristocratic tyranny. It's easy to forget the horrific nature of the governments of Cuba, Russia or China before the revolutions, given the terrible things that happened after. The solution is to keep moving forward, learning from both sets of mistakes, not to return to the old, equally terrible way of doing things, which seems to be what Peterson would prefer. And I thought, okay, well, I understand that. We need our belief systems. They orient us. And that means there will be conflict between belief systems, and that can be a catastrophe. And that's being played out everywhere again in very many ways. What's the solution to that? Well. One possibility is there's no solution. It's just mayhem all the way around. Could be the case. But it seemed to me, as I delved into it, that the proper solution to that was to live properly. The solution, it seems to me, is not what Peterson offers. His conception of what living properly means is unlikely to be universal and without an objectivizing methodology to understand how or why we should live in a particular way, all he is doing is asserting his own subjective standard of how things should be and calling upon tradition and the faded authority of the church and outmoded ways of thinking in order to do so. This is not radical or revolutionary, it is rubbing Vaseline on the lens of history to throw it into soft focus. Harris, whom Peterson is critical of, has done far more interesting work in this area, though it is really only just beginning. Harris suggests that there may be multiple solutions on how to live, and that it is science that can be applied here to find the optimum solution or set of solutions in any given circumstance. It's something that is not an argument from authority or tradition, but an appeal to apply intelligence and problem solving here, as we have everywhere else, to great success. The artists get there before the philosophers, long before the philosophers. The dramatists get there way before the artists even. And so we, we figured it out, we represented it in art and literature and music and drama, and then we're on the cusp, so to speak, of understanding it in a fully articulated manner.
and not a moment too soon. Artists cannot show you or tell you how to live, not in and of themselves, and I'm speaking as a writer and an artist and a creator here. Art can comment, it can suggest, it can explore, it can challenge, it can ask and express points of view. It cannot answer without an input from elsewhere. Philosophy can't answer these questions either, or indeed any question, obsessed as it is with casting doubt and navel-gazing. Theology can, but not with accurate answers. What is 2 plus 2 can be answered with 5, but it is wrong. A wrong answer can be worse than no answer at all. Theology can only give you wrong answers, or answers which are right only by the sheerest of blind chance. What can give you answers to honest questions? What can test them and determine what works and what doesn't? What can tell you what makes human beings happy? None of the things that he suggests at all. And it's conceivable, I think, perhaps probable, that nothing more important conceptually happened in the 20th century than that. Because it was the first time post-enlightenment that a rapprochement between the intellect and the underlying religious archetypal substructure occurred. You have in the capacious intellect of Jung, and the same thing happened to some degree with Piaget, the religious domain and the factual domain were brought back together. This is nonsense. The religious and the factual are irreconcilable. He is perhaps correct that this was a dramatic and important shift, but it wasn't one for the better. Jung's archetypes are interesting, but they're not factual, and can tell you nothing whatsoever about reality. They are stories. Stories are important, they can be influential, but they are by their nature unreal. Even in the retelling of actual events, stories become less real, exaggerated and mythological. More importantly, the problem with religious stories is that people take them as real in the way Peterson tries to claim is a good thing, yet these are the very things that have caused perhaps the most harm in human history. Even communism, which Peterson reviles, committed its worst atrocities when it took narrative over reality in Lysenkoism and other policies which were at odds with reality. This cack-handed attempt to reconcile the subjectivity of narrative and the objectivity of science is responsible for the undermining of the Enlightenment and the rise of subjective postmodernism, one of the very things that Peterson rails against. He has chosen a subjective reality, but it is still a subjective reality, no matter his protestations to the contrary. Objective reality is only reachable by objectivizing our investigations. So do you see archetypes as biological structures? They're at least that. Yeah, they're pre-existing they're pre-existing categories of perception in the, in the Kantian sense. That, that's a good way of thinking about it, is that, you know, the, the pure empiricist thinks that you get all your information from the outside world, right? Mm. But that's not true because you bring an a priori interpretive framework to the world, yeah. and that's instantiated biologically, but then it's also enculturated. This is also bloody nonsense. There's no biological basis for Jung's archetypes. The archetypes are overwhelmingly cultural, albeit in some instances as a result of the realities of our biology, which necessitates mothers, fathers, conflict, cooperation, and so forth, which can be reflected in Jung's archetypes. Even innate instincts, even if we accept this assertion, are empirical in any case. Said information would still arrive by outside forces and experience, even via the brute force method of evolution. Variations in behaviour, temperament, instinct and so on reinforced or eroded by survival utility. Peterson appears to believe in the metaphysical, the non-physical, some sort of platonic space, not as a conceptual framework for understanding reality, but as a reality in and of itself. This is an absurd spiritual belief that constitutes woo-woo. 
there, there's a principle at the, at the heart of Western civilization, and it's older than Christianity, and it's older than Judaism, although both Judaism and Christianity developed it to a great degree. It's the idea of the logos, and the log logos is also the root word of logic, but logos means something like coherent, interpersonal communication of the truth, and from an archetypal perspective, it's the action of the logos that extracts order from chaos. It's the fundamental proposition of Western culture, and we've lost it, and we, we will not survive without it. But all I did was tell the truth. Of course you did, but there's the truth and the truth. Peterson is talking of truth as the truth, capitalized. But what he ends up describing is not that at all. It is this strange, spiritual, unproven, unevidenced idea of a metaphysical, platonic reality behind our reality. But the truth is that the only reliable means we have of even approaching reality is not this narrativistic approach to the world with its innate subjectivity, but the pursuit of objectivity and distance that is found only in science. Peterson makes the personal not only political, but spiritual, and then makes reality claims on that basis, whereas reality itself demands that we make our inquiries impersonal and distanced for us to have any hope of arriving at anything even approaching the actual truth, capitalized or otherwise. The West will die without the rebirth of the Logos, because the West is that. So. With that gone, it's gone. And we've seen what's arisen to replace it. While well, there's fascism, there's communism, and then there's the New Age mess, because it's a mess. And most of it's wish fulfillment and fantasy and inability to, there's creativity in it, but there's no capacity to edit whatsoever. There's no coherence. The term Logos has become essentially meaningless, much like the term spiritual. It has so many different meanings in so many different traditions and contexts that it's virtually impossible to tell what anyone means by it. Peterson appears to be using it in its Christian meaning, which is in and of itself a virtually impenetrable soup of nonsense that strives to conflate the miraculous, irrational and nonsensical basis of Christian mysticism with the very idea of truth and reason itself, a contradiction that is untenable and which normally turns up in the rhetorical obstinacy and bald assertions of presuppositional apologetics, which presumes that God as Logos is necessary for any rational thought whatsoever and so therefore must exist. This is bollocks. Logos can, however, also mean I say, grounds, plea, opinion, expectation, word, speech, account, reason, proportion, discourse, a principle of order or knowledge, the logic behind an argument, persuasion, rhetoric, the divine, an animating principle, premises, an intermediary between man and God, and in Young, Peterson's other great influence, the masculine intellect versus the feminine emotion or eros. Again, ironic, given his arguments and concepts are more emotional than rational. In meaning everything, it essentially means nothing whatsoever. Is there an external truth and reality? Yes. How do we uncover this? The disciplined and objectivized process of science. Does anything else work? No. Do the religious principles that have often used the term Logos and which Peterson invokes support genuine investigation into reality? No. Indeed, these religio-spiritual concepts stood in the way of such a pursuit. What allowed us to progress and to become more, to genuinely understand reality, Logos if you insist, was overcoming, bypassing and surpassing these subjective and spiritual concepts. A reversion to traditionalism, to mysticism, to religion, is not a preservation of Western values. These things do not define the West. The overcoming of them does, and it's that which is under threat, as much by Peterson's ilk, in their way, as the postmodernists they set themselves against, but have much in common with. Postmodernists deny reality. Peterson's cult asserts truth on the basis of irrational authority and the weight of tradition and hierarchy. The cultural, scientific and physical power of the West, the things that made it great. These, the rejection of these ideas and the progress that such a rejection permitted. 
Peterson's assertions are as potentially ruinous as those he sets himself against. The question is, what happens to the world around you as you, embo as you increasingly embody the Logos? And the answer to that is, we don't know. We don't know what the ultimate level of this. Now, the hypothesis is, and it's a hypothesis that extends to some degree to Buddha as well. The hypothesis is that there has been one or two individuals who managed that, and that in their management of that, they transcended death itself. How can you embody a fiction? Can you become Batman? No. Batman is imaginary and beyond any real human's ability to imitate. Jesus is similarly fictional, but Batman is at least human, enhanced by technology and training. Jesus is magic. In many stories, Buddha is also granted abilities that defy physics, and which is bent not by technology, not by understanding, but by faith, belief without evidence, belief without knowledge. This contradicts the idea of Logos as knowledge. This isn't an hypothesis, there is no evidence for these claims. Can we better ourselves by following examples, even fictional examples? Sure, but we should acknowledge the difference between reality and fantasy, the objective and the subjective. You cannot embody or become something that is impossible and does not or cannot exist. Nothing will grant us magical powers, but by overcoming this subjectivity, by discarding faith, by embracing the methodical and evidence-based examination of reality, we gain more power over the universe, by doing the very opposite of what Peterson thinks we should be doing. The opposite of embracing the mystical or the metaphysical. Every public appearance that I've made that's related to the sort of topics that we're discussing is overwhelmingly men. It's like, it's like 85 to 90 percent. And so I thought, wow, that's weird. Like, what the hell's going on here exactly? And then the other thing I've noticed is that I've been talking a lot to the crowds that I've been talking to, not about rights, but about responsibility, right? Because you can't have the bloody converse. What are you doing? You can't have the conversation about rights without the conversation about responsibility because your rights are my responsibility. That's what they are, technically. So you just can't have only half of that discussion, and we're only having half that discussion. And the question is, well, what the hell are you leaving out if you only have that half of the discussion? And the answer is, well, you're leaving out responsibility. And then the question is, well, what are you leaving out if you're leaving out responsibility? And the answer might be, well, maybe you're leaving out the meaning of life. Life cannot be said to have any definitive meaning which is not as terrible as it sounds, as it leaves us free to find or define our own meaning to our own existence and to strive for it. Rights are our responsibilities to each other. He is right that these cannot be disentangled, and right that the conversation has been weighted too much one way for too long. Why do his lectures and assertions appeal to men? Well, while women's roles have been widened and opened up to the point where they can pursue almost any meaning or purpose without much weight of judgement. The roles of men have not changed. Men are still expected to be, and aspire to be, responsible, providers, strong, capable, successful. But the definitions of what makes a man that, and the scope for him to pursue meaning or purpose, has not expanded as it has for women. Women are free to express their animus, their inner male subconscious in Jungian terms, while men are not free to express their anima, their inner female subconscious, again in Jungian terms. Most people of either sex do not really want to do this in any case, which is why we see such massive gender differentials in career and other life choices. But men simply do not have the same option, even if few of them want to take it up. Peterson offers a salve to this pain, where men's options have not widened and in which their traditionalistic roles have been usurped, undermined and demonised not by widening men's capacity to seek meaning and purpose on free and open terms, but by telling them that it's okay to yearn for the traditional, and to say that that is a good thing, inherently and innately. Men appear to be more conservative despite being greater risk-takers, at least from political surveys, voting habits and so on, and so this uh, self-help patter appeals to vulnerabilities in the male psyche and exploits them, intentionally or not, in a way that will not improve matters. He identifies the problem and the loss of male meaning and purpose, the listlessness and perpetual boyhood, 
but its solution is a reassertion of nostalgic tradition, much as it is elsewhere. This is something that can only delay and harm progress on this score, and in the long term, further harm men. It just blows me away. It's like, really? That's what's, that's the counterculture. Grow the hell up and do something useful. Really, I could do that? Oh, I'm so excited by that idea. No one ever mentioned that before. It's like rights, 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 rights. Jesus, it's, it's, it's appalling. It's, it's, and, and I feel that that's deeply felt by the people who are, who are coming out to, to listen to these sorts of things too. They're, they've had enough of that. This is where Peterson's self-help rhetoric, functionally no different to incoherent New Age woo he has criticised, becomes dangerous, just like so many of those do. We do have a problem with victim culture, but this pull-yourself-up-by-your-bootstraps mentality, this sort-yourself-out idea, this take-responsibility-for-your-own-situation dogma, ignores the fact that there genuinely are victims amongst a sea of fakers, that sometimes people need help, assistance, cannot do a thing or things for themselves. This very American idea of personal responsibility and rugged individualism is catastrophic for those with real problems that they cannot overcome because there is nowhere to place the blame but themselves, even when it's not their fault. This is an antagonistic assault on empathy, understanding, sympathy and the responsibility that we have for each other, collectively, to construct a tolerable and loving society. I think it's because in, in a deep level, the West has lost faith in the idea of masculinity. Now, that's no different than the death of God. It's the same thing. And so, and Nietzsche knew what the consequence of that would be. I mean, that's most of what he wrote about, you know, and, and so you'd say, well, the divine symbol of masculinity has been obliterated. Well, so then what do you expect? What it, what's going to happen? It's going to, that means masculinity is going to become weak. And especially if the symbol is also denigrated, right? Which, which it definitely is. So what that means is that the ideal that man could aspire to is denigrated. And well, then with your ideal in tatters, you're weak. That's, that's definitional. Aspiring to be like God is like aspiring to be Superman. It's impossible, and any attempt to do so is doomed to failure. Religion was responsible for horrors for far longer and to a far nastier degree than even the worst of secular ideologies, and informed the very worst of political ideologies, a synthesis of idealism, aspiration and religion. Nazism. Masculinity is not like God, in that men are real and God is not. Nietzsche's proclamation that God was dead was a call upon us to step up and take responsibility, the very thing Peterson simultaneously argues for and undermines with his constant appeals to religion. While the idea of divinity was unchallenged, the world was hell for millennia. It was oppressive, with unquestionable hierarchies claiming power derived from a monstrously evil and fictional divinity. People claiming to speak and act for that horrendous fiction brought about serfdom, torture, burnings, unimaginable pain and degradation for thousands of years. Even with the horrors of the 20th century taken into account, even with the horrors of the French Revolution, of industrialization and the wicked psychopathy of consciousness capital, we now live in a far more peaceful, humane and safe time than we ever did before, precisely by rejecting many of the things Peterson asserts and pulling back from the things that his enemies assert. Is a complete assault on two things. One, it's, it's an assault on the metaphysical substrate of our culture, and I would say that the metaphysical substrate looks something like a religious substrate, so it's a direct assault on that. And the second thing it's an assault on is everything that's been established since the Enlightenment. Rationality, empiricism, science, everything. Clarity of mind, dialogue, um, the idea of the individual, all of that is, is not only, you see, it's not only that it's up for grabs. That's not the thing. It's to be destroyed. These are perfectly accurate and valid concerns. Postmodernism is destructive in its denial of truth 
of knowledge and its embrace of subjectivity overall, its corrosive effect particularly upon science is especially worrisome and destructive, as it has discredited whole fields due to its problems. Peterson's psychology is no more a real science in this environment than feminist glacier theory, and much of what he asserts and appeals to is as much of a threat to rationality and reason, to the ground gained by the Enlightenment, as postmodernists are. He appeals to a pre-Enlightenment state. They push for a post-Enlightenment state. Both are corrosive to reason, science and all the progress we have ever made as a species. And the enemy of my enemy is not necessarily my friend. I share Peterson's frustration and suspicions towards newspeak and redefinitions of terms and about being mischaracterised. He tends to think at a higher level of order than the immediate, which few people do. I'm the same, looking to the patterns behind and above the symptoms, but this does open one up to criticism and attack by those who only see the immediate. The problem with gender pronouns, not the problem with the philosophy behind it. Well, through listening to it, it started to make sense of a lot of what I've been doing over the last few years. I've done quite a lot of sort of deep transformational practices, a lot of shadow work, so integrating the shadow, mm -hmm. and, and actually feeling that real sense of becoming more in alignment with myself, mm -hmm. feeling that my, these different parts of myself coming together and feeling more embodied and more present in the world. Um, but it was through listening to you that I made this connection with the Logos, with the idea that this is actually a deep principle of, of Western culture, which gave it another... Oh, it's, real it's the principle of the Incarnation, mm. right? Because the Incarnation is, is a, at least a symbolic representation of the idea that the Spirit has to fully inhabit the body. He discovered that children have things called Marlocks in their bodies. And when an adult has sex with a child, the Marlocks implode, feeding the adult's receptor cavity with energy that causes immortality, so say the ruler of Bethos. Does anything really need to be said here. There's value in introspection, self-reflection and self-improvement, but this is gobbledygook, such as you'll find claimed and asserted in many self-help traditions. The difference here, perhaps, is only that Peterson's self-help gibberish appeals to Western traditions, rather than the trendier and more exotic-seeming Eastern traditions that one finds more commonly referenced. Perhaps these ideas are finally old enough to seem exotic and to have appeal in the same way that these kind of appeals did. The past is a foreign country. Since he came to public attention, Peterson has been doing the seemingly impossible convincing hardened atheists of the value of religion. He's a scientist, but not a materialist, and criticises the likes of Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris. This is why I have such frustration, say, with people like Sam Harris, the sort of radical atheists, because they seem to think that once human beings abandon their, their grounding in the transcendent, that the, the plausible way forward is with a kind of purest rationality that automatically attributes to other people equivalent value. It's like, I just don't understand that. It, it, they believe that that's the rational pathway. What the hell is irrational about me getting exactly what I want from every one of you whenever I want it at every possible second? To not understand a thing doesn't mean that thing isn't correct or doesn't have value. If you want to hear frustration, listen to Harris a much stronger and more revolutionary thinker than Peterson. Talk about his attempts to have discourse with Peterson. Better yet, listen to the podcasts where he attempts to do so. Much as Peterson's infamous interview with Kathy Young exposed her irrationality and blather, so Harris's conversation with Peterson exposed the hollow and irrational nature of much of his. The question here is rather simple to answer. Why? Isn't it rational that you get whatever you want from everyone else whenever you want? Because you wouldn't like that if it were applied to you. It's enlightened self-interest, the golden rule, our evolved reciprocity as a social species, the survival advantage of cooperation. Peterson's inability to understand this is something more commonly found in the worst excesses of the evangelical religious lobby and sociopaths. Mythology and religion parasitized upon these natural tendencies in humanity, and Peterson has cause and effect entirely backwards. So I did invite Jordan on the podcast, and you are about to hear that conversation. And I am 
as I say at the end, going to rely on all of you to figure out what happened. Because from my point of view, we got bogged down on a very narrow point of more than just philosophical interest. We got bogged down on what it means to say that something is true. I don't, un see, to me, I think that, that the universe that people like Dawkins and Harris inhabit is so intensely conditioned by mythological presuppositions that they take for granted the, the ethic that emerges out of that as if it's just a given, a rational given. And this, of course, precisely do, not Nietzsche's observation as well as Dostoevsky's. That's Nietzsche's observation. You don't get it. The ethic that you think is normative is a consequence of its, of, its, of its nesting inside this tremendously lengthy history, much of which was expressed in mythological formulation. Again, this is entirely backwards. Religion, mythology has parasitized and perverted human moral and ethical systems, which their most basic emerge from evolutionary psychology. They're axiomatic, the ones that are, because they work, because they have and retain survival utility. It is in our interest as a species, or in the interest of our genes at least, to work together, to minimize disruption and death, to care about and for one another, especially kin. Mythology has attempted to explain this and, like a virus, has taken over its functions in order to spread itself, causing great harm in the process. Harris examines these issues rationally, scientifically. Peterson takes them on the basis of tradition and authority, not on the basis of utility, functionality, or proven worth. He examines the virus, not the cell that the virus has infected. Harris, Dawkins, etc. are scraping the layer of mythological bullshit off of the reality beneath. Mythology can be great to explain and exemplify these things, but only if it's not taken as true. Our culture is predicated upon our having overcome and emerged from the darkness, the irrationality and the ignorance of religion and mysticism, not upon indulging in it. That way lies the living hell of the Islamic theocracies. What are the prerequisites for true knowledge and understanding? Because it seems to me that intelligence is only a small matter of seeing and understanding properly, and it takes a certain amount of moral courage. It takes a certain amount of having done the work of introspection, having done the work of deep introspection. What do you think the, the components are for true knowledge and understanding? Well, I think, I think the motivation one of the best motivations is existential terror. You know, I mean, I don't remember where this is in the Old Testament, but the line is, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And Do what you can to, well, at least not make it worse, but maybe to make it better. You know you can. You know you can make it worse and better. You just don't know how much. Find out. Peterson's not without worth, but much of what he says and does is empty rhetoric, buzzwords, woo, nonsense. He's telling people often what they want to hear, and what you want to hear is not necessarily what you need to hear. He's a principled man and has taken an effective stance against the excesses of the new moral minority. But he's not a revolutionary thinker, just yet another incarnation of tradition and nostalgia. He diagnoses correctly many things that are going wrong, such as the problem around men. 
But his answer is not development, not to overcome, not to surpass, despite his pretensions to transcendence, but rather to exalt and reify the things that shaped the West before it became the West. He's repackaging a syncretic form of Christianity, without saying so, as a form of self-help with all the intellectual gravitas of the secret rooted in psychological Jungian pseudoscience and mystical Gnostic heresy. This may well be a case where the proposed cure is almost as bad as the disease. New isn't necessarily better, but neither Peterson nor his opposition are actually offering anything new. They're both offering the repackaged disasters of the past, two opposing forms of inhumanity that we had grown beyond. History isn't a constant ascent, slips backward a common, but perhaps in acknowledging that Peterson and his opponents are both attempting to drag us back down into the mire, we can reassert our rationality and move beyond them both. Peterson is a pious liar. That means someone who doesn't know that what they're offering is untrue. He's a snake oil salesman who believes in the power of his curative. And this has created a cult around him. And this is unfortunate. Speaking with authority and self-belief doesn't make what you're saying true or right or helpful. But people are so desperate for some kind of answer have been so rejected by the stronger currents of society at the moment that they will cling to what he has to offer like a life raft, even if ultimately it may end up being even worse for them. We need to find new ways of thinking. We need to reject both of these camps. I don't know what that will look like. I'm not really in a position myself to explore it, but I am in enough of a position to know that we really don't want to revisit the mistakes of the past, either of them. We need to do better. <laughs>